Greetings and welcome. My name is Adam Sweeting. I am the former Ward 3 School Committee representative, and I'm honored today to serve as the moderator for the Ward 5 City Council debate. And I want to thank the Somerville Media Center for organizing and hosting this forum. Uh, the preliminary election for this race will be held and the mayoral race on September 14th. At that point, uh, the top two vote getters will be moved to the final election, which will be held on Tuesday, November 21st. Pardon me, Tuesday, November 2nd of 2021. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> so we have the three certified candidates who will appear on the preliminary ballot, uh, and they will soon have the opportunity to introduce themselves. But to get us started, I will introduce each of them by name. And we agreed beforehand that we would use, once the discussion goes, their, their, their first names uh, during, during the debate. Um, so we have with us, and I'm going left to right, Tessa Bridge, Todd Easton, and Beatriz Gomez Moacad. Our program is going to unfold as follows. In part one, I will ask a series of questions, and each candidate will have one minute to respond. The general topics for these questions were distributed to the candidates the day before today, uh, but they were not presented with the specific questions. In part two of the debate, candidates will ask a 30-second question of the other two candidates, each of whom will then have an opportunity to respond in one minute. Uh, if we have time at the end, each candidate will have a minute to give a summarizing statement uh, about their campaign. So thank you again, candidates, for participating. And I will now ask each of you to give a two-minute introduction of yourself your campaign, and your vision for Ward 5 and the city of Somerville. So I will begin left to right with Tessa Bridge. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Tessa Bridge, and I'm running for city council in Ward 5 because I believe that Somerville can be an equitable, sustainable, and healthy community for all. There is so much that is wonderful about Somerville, and this city is not working for everyone. Many people can no longer afford to live here. Educators and other municipal workers are having to commute from faraway towns and are not able to be part of the fabric of our community. Young people and older people alike are being displaced. And although we tout Somerville's diversity as one of our community's biggest assets, we are failing to invest in policies that support people without privilege to live here. Pedestrians are being killed in our streets because we are not systematically addressing our dependence on cars and our budget does not reflect the values we profess to hold. I am running because I am not willing to accept the status quo. Our community is at a crossroads. We have an essential question in front of us as a city. What kind of community do we want to be and who gets to decide that? To become an equitable, sustainable, and healthy community for all, we must name the ways that power and privilege shape our policies and practices and deeply engage with parts of our community that have not had voice in decision making. I have done this as a racial justice organizer in Cambridge Public Schools, fighting for the transfer fee and against the frit waiver with Our Revolution Somerville, and fighting for a living wage for paraprofessionals with the Somerville Educators Union. I have consistently fought for justice, stood up to power, and organized to build grassroots power. We need that kind of strength, clarity of values, and vision on the city council. As city councilor, I will be transparent, dedicated, and accountable to you. I will work to build people power in our city to push for the future we deserve. I will not act in fear or turn away from a challenge and will advocate from a place of integrity and commitment to the values of equity and justice. I look forward to working with all of you so together we can build a Somerville that works for all of us. Thank you. And our next candidate to speak will be Todd Easton. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to the Somerville Media Center for hosting this event this afternoon. Somerville has some big changes ahead and I'm excited about the opportunities before us. My name is Todd Easton and I'm a candidate for Ward 5 City Council. My wife Debbie and I moved here 20 years ago and we've raised our three kids here. Today, Simon is 19, Helena is 16, and Emmett is 14, and they are all proud products of the Somerville Public Schools. We will see a lot of new faces in city government after this election. What our Somerville needs on our city council are people who focused on our local needs right here, right now. I've watched the city grow and change over the years, and I've been involved from the very beginning through community service. I transformed my passion for athletics into volunteer work with our local youth sports. 
As an avid artist and arts enthusiast, I found opportunities to volunteer with the Somerville Arts Council. My passion for health and wellness pushed me to take action on food insecurity through programs like the Jewish Family and Children's Service Family Table Program and Food for Free, a weekend lunch bag program with the Somerville Public Schools. Today, I hope to continue the service as the next Ward 5 counselor. I look forward to today's debate. Thank you, Todd. And our next candidate is uh, Beatrice gomez Moacad. Thank you to the Media Center for hosting this event. And thank you all for joining us. My name is Beatriz Gomez Moacad, and I'm war your Ward 5 City Council candidate. I'm a Puerto Rican born architect, a resident of the city for 18 years, and the mother of two beautiful children in the Somerville Public Schools, Isabel and Marco. I'm running for City Council because I love this city with its immigrant and working class roots, and I want to put my professional and my personal experience to work to make Somerville a more equitable, more sustainable, and a place where people of all backgrounds can feel welcome and thrive. I have been active in the city for many years. I have participated in design review committees for new developments, sat on the boards of nonprofits and youth leagues. I've, I, I have also been vocal voice at times in school committee, city council, and other meetings pointing out social inequities, language barriers, and the environmental injustice of I-93. During the pandemic, I saw Somerville come together to help those in need but I also saw huge inequities that were exacerbated by language and cultural barriers. As a bilingual, bicultural Puerto Rican, I knew I needed to step up. Equity and diversity and inclusion are not theoretical issues for me. They're part of my life. To make it in this country, I had to learn to adapt and communicate and collaborate with people whose backgrounds are very different from my own. My life experience has prepared me well to serve a very diverse community and recognize the value and humanity in all our neighbors. My professional skills are also deeply relevant to Ward 5's needs. For over 25 years, I have worked in project management, construction, planning, and affordable housing, including cutting edge sustainable projects. I know how development works, and I will advocate for a more sustainable and equitable city. As a city councilor, I will always strive to listen, understand, and help bring our community together to develop creative solutions and uh, address our shared concerns and values. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beatriz. So now we will move into uh, the questions from the moderator. Uh, and uh, I've got a series of questions that some are kind of Ward 5 specific and some are more citywide. And um, so I guess I'll start with a, somewhat of a Ward 5 specific question. Um, and uh, Tessa will be the first respondent. Okay. As we know from the history of the arrival of new transit stations, uh, these can significantly alter the economics and the character of a neighborhood. Uh, and we have in Ward 5 uh, two new stations which will be opening up with the extension of the Green Line uh, at Ball Square and Magoon Square, sort of right in the heart of Ward 5. So I'm going to ask you, what, do you, what role do you anticipate playing as the Ward 5 counselor for supporting the residents and business communities in these squares in light of the changes that will come with the opening of these Green Line stations. So we'll begin with Tessa. Great, thank you for this question. Um, we are bound to see change coming to Ward 5 in the coming years, and that includes in our squares. Our squares are going to change. Um, there's some inevitability to that as the Green Line comes through, as our city changes and grows. And the question is really, how are we going to decide and make intentional choices about the way that change manifests? So I really believe that we need to ensure that our squares are mixed use, mixed income, are full of mixed use, mixed income developments that have housing that is affordable, that have thriving businesses that are there, that are centered around workers. Um, and that really keep the character and charm of the community that so many of us love. Um, we really need to think about the ways that our squares are designed. Currently our squares are largely um, structures around cars and we need to make sure that they're public gathering spaces where people can come together. And we also need to make sure that residents and workers are setting the tone for how development happens. This can be done through um, zoning, with upzoning around squares, and also by developing with CBAs, community benefit agreements, so that residents and workers are actually driving decision making and how development comes to our community. Okay, thank you. Todd, Todd Eastman. So the one first thing I'd like to acknowledge is that we're still in a pandemic. And we're not at a point where everybody is stable and living um, with the things that they need. 
I think we need to look forward to the opening of the green lines. And with that, we have to reach out into the community and make sure that they are engaged in what type of mm -hmm. development goes on in the squares in particular. Um, we have to be mindful of uh, what has happened in other parts of the city and take best practices from those areas and implement them then into Ball and Magoon Square. Um, that being said, the small businesses in those communities need to be involved in those conversations from the beginning also. Um, smart growth, smart investment, uh, will lead to long-term development that will uh, be inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. Just the fact that we are able to build doesn't mean we should build so much that it puts a burden on the community itself. So we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. Patrice? So the first thing when you're looking at urban development is for the community to come together and have a vision. What do we want our squares to look like? I think that's an important factor that we always forget. We let outside forces develop mm -hmm. that. We also have to be considerate of the fact that they're local businesses, many owned by immigrants, for example, in Magoon Square. We need to protect those businesses because with growth comes displacement. Let's look at Harvard Square. It's a sea of banks a sea of chains. Is that what we want Ball and Magoon Square to look like? These are conversations we need to think about. Now that the green line is coming, we also need to think of five-minute neighborhoods. Do we have all the amenities close to public transportation that we need? I think we have a good infrastructure to start with, but we should be building around that. We need to engage our communities, as I said before, and we need to understand we are promoting density that not all density works with our urban fabric. Is a 23-story building appropriate next to a two-family home? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to our second question, and this question, uh, Todd, will have the, the first response. Um, and this is one I know is being asked at all the forums. We all know that the issue of affordability and affordable housing is and will be uh, one of the most significant challenges facing the city of Somerville. In fact, there may be no greater challenge that we face as a city. Uh, the topic comes up at every forum and political discussion in the city, but it's one that must be asked. So my question is, what policies would you specifically advocate for as a member of the city council? And in what ways do you think those policies would help the city address its, this pressing, pressing issue? As far as the policies that are there, um, there are a lot of them to choose from, and I am not uh, astute in all of them. That being said, to find out what we need to do going forward is to engage the community itself and find out what they want. Um, it's one thing to ask me what I want, but I want to make sure that I'm representing what the people want. And so going forward, we need to have dialogue to find out from uh, the whole community as far as what their affordability issues are. It's a broad spectrum term, and some people don't necessarily feel like they fall into it. Um, we know that low-income families are affected by this. Uh, we know that young people with new jobs are living in the city and they can't afford to be here. Um, one group that I feel that is always excluded are the artists. So we need to incorporate them into the city conversation also to see what they need to be able to sustain and survive here. So uh, policy issues need to come from the constituency and I will be happy to take those forward to have the dialogue continue. Thank you. Beatrice? So I want to start with this. Housing is an extremely complex issue and it requires multiple solutions. I have said this before, countries that address their housing um, crisis subsidize over 50% of their housing. Somerville has only 10% of housing with deed restrictions. I have worked in housing. I know how limited funds are. I have sat at a table with dozens of lawyers because our funding sources come from all angles. I understand it's very hard. And that's why we need to understand and set priorities. Where is it more important to invest? Is it our more vulnerable populations of 30% less than median that are vulnerable? So again, we need a plan. We need a vision. We need to say how to invest our funds. But we also need to find ways to increase our funding. We need to look at our linkage fees. They're much lower than Cambridge at $20 versus us at $10. We need, um, we need to look at our CPA funds and look at increasing them. We started CPA funds very late compared to Cambridge. I think in other ways we need to look at creative forms of construction to lower costs. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Tessa? 
Yeah, um, housing is the absolute number one issue I hear about on doors when I'm talking to residents in our community. And I want to start off by saying housing is a fundamental human right and it is our obligation as a society to find a way to provide accessible, quality, um, affordable housing to people who live here. Um, and we need to take bold action now to address the urgency of the crisis that we're facing. Um, and this means building on existing affordable housing policies, like increasing the percentage of affordable housing for new developments. It means focusing on transit-oriented housing, particularly along the new Green Line stops, um, including upzoning. It means moving more funds into the community land trust so we can bring land into the public domain. And overall, what we need to do is put more money into housing. We have money in our city from a range of sources, including linkage fees, the American Rescue Plan, money we're getting back from the Green Line, and commercial revenue. This is a moral choice of how we spend our dollars. We need to build public housing in our city, including mixed income, social housing, um, so that we can actually provide housing to the residents who need it. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. So we will now move on to our next question. Uh, and this one, uh, Beatrice will have the first response. Thank you. Um, it's a, another topic that comes up again and again, uh, concerns the proper role of the, of the police department in the city. Uh, and as we know from watching the news, this is nationally a, a topic as, as of concern as well. And so here I'd like to offer uh, a list of verbs, okay, and to ask each candidate what verb they would most like to see associated with their particular campaign and their plans for the city council. So here's my list of verbs, okay. Uh, would you support to, uh, to defund the police? If so, by how much? Would you support reform the police? If so, how? Would you support ab to abolish the police? If so, why? Would you support retaining the current role and structure of the police? And if so, why? So those are the four verbs, defund, reform, abolish, retain. I'm going to use the word reform. And I first want to start, this is a question that it, it's a very big concern across the community. There's very, very different perspectives. Um, and I want to use the word reform because there's always room for improvement. And the other issue is we are dealing with some issues of systemic racism across all our institutions. It's not just the police. So I think we need to look how to improve and be better. But I want to um, make a, a quick observation, and that is the fact that the police address an issue that is the, uh, it's the, at the end of where our society has failed. And let's start, give the example of mental illness. Police respond to an urgent crisis. And in fact, I have been studying this a lot. The police ref respond a lot of times to mental illness. But it's not, it, the, the buck doesn't stop there. It's our overall society, societal perspective on mental illness that we need to address. So it's not just the police. So my point is, we need to reform the police. We need to address issues of systemic racism, but we need to address this across all our institutions. And I want to add one more note, and that is uh, let's talk about the case in the Argentiana school of a child who has a criminal record. I mean, this is, this is telling you that we need to extend our reform, and we, it's not just limited to the police. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tessa? Yeah. You, you did the list of verbs? You need it again? Or you have I got it. Okay. I wrote it down, right. so okay. I'm good. Um, I support defunding our police by 10% each year for now. I believe that policing um, has taken on a role in our society that has greatly expanded over time. Police are responding to a lack of investment in social programs, which means that they are often responding in cases that fall outside their role of enforcing the law. And this isn't meeting the need of our society, it's punitive rather than it's wellness centered, and it's very expensive for our community. So to me, what defunding the police means is taking resources that we currently allocate towards reactive, punitive responses and putting them into proactive, wellness centered approaches to supporting our community. So that means more resources towards housing stability, more resources towards mental health, supports for unhoused people. It also means reallocating some funds from the SPD budget for a non-police emergency response service. So that in the cases where a mental health, health counselor, a paramedic, or a social worker can respond, we have a program in place to do that. Um, and this will greatly reduce the number of calls for service that police are responding to and allow police to focus on the job of law enforcement, which is why most police officers got into the profession in the first place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Todd? I'm for retaining the police department as it is with looking at how it operates. Uh, we're at a time where all our departments should be looked at from top down to see how they're operating and see what best practices are working and what is not working. Um, we need to make sure that the police force is involved in the conversation as far as what we might do with reallocation of funds. Um, police officers go through continual ed education training. Um, I know firsthand because I talk to the police officers on the street and that, you know, they talk to me very candidly about what goes on on the street and, you know, mental illness is one component of the things that they have to deal with on a regular basis along with people with substance abuse. Uh, modern policing has changed a lot and, you know, we need to support them as best as possible. So uh, before we start reallocating funds and taking them away from the police budget, we, we should look at how can we reallocate those funds to be used better to uh, support the police officers on the streets today. Okay, thank you. So, um, so we're now, uh, uh, next question, I guess Tessa will have the first response okay. here. Um, and uh, this is a question concerning uh, an important cultural facility in, in Ward 5. Okay, in recent months, the city of Somerville has assumed control of the armory on Highland Avenue uh, through eminent domain. Uh, there's a long, complicated history to this process, which I don't really want to rehash here, okay? Um, so what I want to know is, well, we know that the, the city is now in control of the armory. Uh, as the city councilor for Ward 5, what would you support and advocate for uh, a new armory or to happen in, the, in this space in the, in the armory? Um, so first of all, I'm very glad that the city decided to purchase this property and dedicate it to the arts for now and for the future. Somerville has a history of underinvesting in the arts and in the Arts Council. Um, and this is a move that is about making sure that artists aren't displaced from our community, which I think most of us can agree is a really positive move. Um, also, the Armory serves a really important role as a gathering space. We have very few community gathering spaces in our community, and particularly in Ward 5. Um, and so I'm really excited to continue to have this space to gather. Um, there's a lot of really nuanced decisions to be made moving forward around this property, but you know, at a baseline, I really would like to see the Armory continue much as it has been. I'd like to see that the tenants who are currently there are not displaced. Um, and I'd really like to see the city taking control of the armory really being used as a model for how we move forward. We have many cultural institutions in this city, including the Somerville Media Center, who are insecure in their homes. And I think this is a way that we can really think about using an eminent domain along with programs to build public housing with mixed use spaces that can also house our cultural institutions. Great, thank you. Thank you. T Todd? I'm very excited about the opportunity of the city uh, taking over control of the armory. Um, it shows that they know how important the arts and culture are to our community. Um, again, Somerville didn't get to where it is without the help of the artists and the cultural community that is here. Um, they bring initiatives, ideas, things that we don't necessarily see regularly in our work day that um, bring, our, bring added value to our lives. Uh, uh, the Somerville Arts Council does what it does with its budget. Um, I believe that we sh should increase that budget as best we can to give them the, the money to hire the right staff to be able to improve on what they're doing. Um, they've done a lot over the years with a very small budget and uh, one thing to say, we need to engage the local artists and gather them together to make, ask them what they want to do and what they want to see happen with this space. That being said, I'd also make sure that we involve the second largest uh, arts group at Vernon Street into the conversation because down the line there might be changes in that neighborhood and we have to look out for them also. All right. Thank you. I agree with Todd that we should um, include the local artists in the discussions but I want to give a model that I grew up with. I, um, I, um, I, I grew up as an artist as a young age uh, from fifth grade on. I went to this place called La, uh, La Liga de Arte de San Juan. It was a place where local artists taught children and adults. We came together, I spent my entire youth there, you know, and I would go out to the community to draw. It was a way to engage both the artists and go out into the community. There were world-class artists that I participated, people who won Biennales in Italy. And I think we have so many artists, it's so rich. We need to bring both factors together. I also want to bring in a cultural aspect, and we have cultures here, I'm going to speak from the Latino culture, we say art is very much part of our culture. So I believe this is another way to engage our community uh, and bring on that together. Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, our next question, I believe Todd will have the first response to this one. 
uh, and this concerns uh, green space and, and open space in the city. Uh, recently, the city of Somerville announced plans to redesign Junction Park in Ward 5, which is the area just south of the Derby Desk Company building. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small but important green space uh, in such a densely populated city and where open space is, is limited. What are your ideas for, uh, for how we might increase and sustain green space within Ford Ward 5 in ways that balance the need for recreation, sustainability and environmental concern, as well as the physical and mental health needs of our neighborhoods? In other words, how would you see open space, your, oh, how would open space needs in your role, uh, in your factor, in your role as a city councilor for Ward 5? As we all know, open space in 4.2 square miles of Somerville is very, very limited. So what we do have, we have to maximize to its best potential. Um, the addition of, uh, I think, 0.83 acres to the park is uh, nice to see us getting, um, but we need to be mindful of how we can use it best serve for the Ward 5 and the greater community. Um, the city also should look at what we have available uh, as far as land. Um, I'm not completely sure that, uh, that there are places that we can't get our hands on that we can increase the size of our open spaces. Um, we, there might be spaces or pockets that we can, can co-opt or put together or work with developers in opening up to expand our open spaces. Um, the important part also is we have to have community engagement in whatever we do so no one's excluded from the conversations of what we do with our facilities. Thank you. Beatrice? So as someone who works in healthcare and where we are really pushing in healthcare the need of nature for wellness, we call that biophilia, it's a relationship of humans to nature and how that brings wellness. I recognize the importance of your, our open space. Also of a long time advocate of sustainability, I also understand the importance of green space for our community. And I think that the, the first, uh, I want to expand the concept of open space to not just being uh, our parks, but starting to think our developments. I'm seeing a lot of surface parking out there for new housing developments. We even do sometimes a previous surface. And to me, that's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship to open space. So we need to start questioning, are we putting too, trying to fit too much in one little box and eliminating um, uh, uh, that? I also think we need to look at really at their expansion of our tree canopy. And again, when we're looking at these green spaces, we need to involve everyone in our community. When I saw that notice, I immediately sent an, a note to the um, lead on the parkour. But there are people, there are the dog people, they are the elderly as well, we need to account. So everybody in the community needs to be part of this. Okay, thank you. Tessa? Yeah, so, you know, as folks have already said, Somerville is the most densely populated city in New England. Um, and nearly a quarter of our city is streets and sidewalks. So we really need to think about space in our community as a scarce resource and consider carefully how we allocate it. Um, you know, when we don't have green space, it has major climate impacts through heat island effects. Um, it also has major equity impacts. Different parts of our community have very different accesses to green space, and that is true even within Ward 5. Um, so we need to really think about this as an equity issue as well as a climate justice issue. Um, and in order to create, increase our access to green space, we'll take creativity and commitment given all of the competing need for our limited square footage. Um, so we need to do things like prioritize tree planting and maintenance. We need to make sure that when developments or even houses are being built or renovated, we're not cutting down trees as part of that. Um, we need to require developers to include green space in our building plans. We need to build more green ways to link our squares and make sure that we have multi-use spaces for recreation, transportation, and crime climate sustainability. All right, thank you. So we have one more question in this first round, and it's kind of a, a, a meta question. It's not sort of specific about a particular topic. Um, and so, um, so there's, I guess, lots of room for philosophy and speculation here. So the question, and uh, Beatrice would have the first response, is how do you see questions of open space, mm -hmm. our business square, such as Magoon and Ball Square, and affordability intersecting. How do these how do these ideas of open space, the health of our business squares, and affordability, how do they come together? And what what role can a city councilor play in bringing these ideas together? Well, that's the premise of my platform: that cities are ecosystems, and we need a balance. 
We need affordable housing. We need open space. We need to support our local businesses. I've been, I was an urban studies major. I studied cities forever. And the one thing I learned is you want a diverse economy. You want a diverse city. Those are the most successful cities. And to do that first, you have to establish goals. Who do we want to be? Who do we want to look like? Because that's one of the biggest issues in American urban development. We let a, urban development happen on its own, and we have no vision. So it sometimes ends up in, in this ad hoc situation. Look at the seaport, where it had all these different pieces of development. I think in Somerville, especially in Ward 5, with the green line coming, we're in time. It's time for us to sit down, have a vision of what we want, understand what is our need for open space, understand what we um, have for affordable housing. And I want to add Ward 5, we're not very rich in affordable housing, so we really should be working mm -hmm. on that. And we need to look at preserving our local businesses and expanding on other local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Tessa? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Beatrice just listed. Having a vision and a plan is incredibly important so that we can move on purpose instead of in an ad hoc way that is often driven by developers. Um, I'll add to that that um, we need to be involving the community very intentionally in how we decide to build. And we actually need to be, you know, supporting the community to have levers of power in decision making. And this is why a tool like community benefits agreements is so important. By investing in training, in providing spaces, in providing legal counsel to neighborhood associations, we can actually put residents and workers in the driver's seat of determining what our communities look like as the change comes. I also think city council has a huge role to play in holding a line with development. We have seen over and over again that even with the best laid plans, when developers come into our community, the promises are not always followed through on. And so we have a really important role to play as an oversight body here in making sure that development meets the goals that we set, that residents are centered, that workers are centered in decisions moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Todd. Um, I'd like to make sure that the city tells us what's going, what might happen in the square. Um, from that, we can engage the public and find out what they want to see happen in the squares. Uh, we need to make sure that we ha are not rushed in putting something together just because we have the open space and um, new development is coming. We need to have thoughtful consideration about how we want to have open space, how we're going to help the businesses while it's under construction, and making sure that everybody has ac uh, accessible and sustainable and equitable uh, opportunities to use those spaces. So you know, dialogue is very important to all of this. We shouldn't be in a rush to do something just because it's there. Um, as we can see with Assembly Square, that didn't happen overnight. So uh, we need to do the same thing with the thoughtful considerations in Magoon Square also and Ball. All right. Thank you. So that will uh, conclude our first, the first part of our uh, forum. Uh, and we'll now move into part two. Uh, where the candidates will uh, ask uh, questions. And again, the format is each candidate will uh, have 30 seconds to pose a question, and then the other two candidates will respond uh, for appro approximately a minute. So I think we'll start this time. Todd, we started with Tessa. So Todd, you'll, you'll ask the first question okay, to, for the two candidates. Uh, Tessa, what's your view of the Somerville Police Department today as it operates? Um, well, I think I spoke a little bit to this in my, my, um, my point earlier um, around policing. I think that currently our police are handling many issues that do not belong in, in policing. You mentioned yourself, mental health, um, substance abuse, overdoses. Um, these are things that we, um, police officers, need additional training to be able to respond to and is not necessarily the best way to respond to these issues. So I think that the police department is incredibly overstretched, which you hear when you, you know, listen to the budget um, hearings around policing. And I don't believe that putting more money into the police department is the solution to that problem. I think we need to think about policing as part of a, a reimagining of our public safety in infrastructure in our city. And really think critically about what is the role of policing and the role of police in the wellness um, and care network that we provide to our community. And I don't think that police need a larger role. Um, I think police need a much smaller footprint and that we need to beef up the other supports that we have for our community members. So Todd, the same question to, to Beatrice? Or, okay, Beatrice? 
So one of the things I want to acknowledge, um, our Somerville Police has this program called Core Community Outreach Health Recovery. Mm -hmm. It is led by, I talked to a social worker here who says the social worker leading this is, is one of the leaders in this. So I think I want to recognize some of the great things our police department has and we, how we, it's sometimes we should be building on that. And I want to address another issue. For Todd, me, and Tessa, it's easy for us to talk about less police. We, we, we don't worry about crime that much. I don't think we do. But I think we need to bring to the table those who are mostly concerned about crime, who are most impacted by crime. I was talking um, to someone recently and said, what happens to me if my boyfriend is trying to take money away from me, money to feed my children? Am I going to get a social worker or a police? I mean, and we need to respond to their concerns and, and work with them on that. Okay. Thank you. So if you have a chance now to ask a question of your two fellow candidates. So during co the COVID uh, pandemic, there was some frustration in the Latino community because they felt the white administrators, elected officials, were representing their views, and they really didn't have a voice. They weren't listened to. What do you believe is the importance of having a diverse community directly represented in our elected bodies and our government agencies, particularly our leadership, and having those representatives have direct culture and language understanding? Tessa? Okay. okay. Sure. Um, I think representation is extremely important, um, and I think that representation in our elected roles is important, and representation in our government structure is important, in our departments, and investing in community engagement to get make sure that not only are we inviting folks into our spaces, but that we as a city are going to where people are. We are able to speak to people in their native languages, in, um, speak in ways that are culturally relevant and connected to build trust and build relationship. I definitely think that's important. Um, I also think that policy really matters. And I think that, you know, amongst the three of us, we all have very different theories of change that we are offering as a vision to our community. And I think, you know, representation is one part of that conversation, but also the vision and the strategies to get there that we are each offering is part of that as well. And so I think, you know, communities of color, as with all communities, are not a monolith. And I think our community really has a, a right, and we owe it to them, to offer these multiple perspectives that we are here today and in our campaigns so that folks really have choice in buying into a vision for our city that aligns most with what they believe and want. Thank you. Um, Todd, Todd, do you want to follow up on uh, the question from Beatrice? Uh, Tessa did a good job explaining <laughs> how things are going. Um, I would, I'm very happy and excited over the fact that this election cycle citywide the people have a variety of choices to choose from. That hasn't always been the case here. Um, we are growing and moving in the right direction. Uh, that being said, uh, the opportunities out there for people to make a decision on what they want representing them is very important. So uh, we need to do our jobs to be able to um, get to where we want to be as a candidate. So uh, the work that we're doing tonight um, will, will end up uh, allowing you to make a choice moving the city in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, so Tessa, your your turn to pose a question okay. to the your your colleagues or fellow candidates. Okay, um, development is inevitably coming to Ward Five, and we have a history in Somerville of developing via public-private partnerships and without prevailing wage, which leaves workers behind. What will you do as city councilor to ensure that major development in Ward Five employs local residents and pays prevailing wage? Right. Todd. Uh, we need to um, back up what we say. Uh, the city has done developments in the past where they said that uh, developers were going to pay prevailing wages and things like that, and for whatever reason, um, it, they didn't follow through on it. Um, I scratch my head at this because we're, um, we want our uh, government to hold uh, the deals that they make accountable to themselves and to the people. Um, we need to come up with uh, ways to uh, hold developers accountable and make sure that you know going forward whoever we're working with represents us and our values as far as the city is concerned. 
So right. this is my cup of tea as I work in construction, and I'm actually uh, part of a committee now trying to increase diversity, have people that represent our community. The first thing we, know, we can wish for prevailing wage and having people in our community, we need to train the people in our community. We need to make sure we're training. We also need to make sure we're reflective of our diversity. I just met with a union person saying, how, how can we engage our high school and you to bring together everybody? Buddy, and start having our, um, our trades really reflecting what our community looks like. So this is my cup of tea. I'm willing to work. In fact, um, a few weeks ago, uh, um, I belong, uh, I'm part of this group, or I attend the meetings. I'm not officially. It's uh, uh, women in construction. And they had a seminar, and I, you know, I sent it down to the high school. So these are the ways we, ne we need to facilitate this process. All right. Well, thank you, candidates. Wow, we got through lots of really good questions there. And I think we have time for each candidate to give a summarizing statement. Uh, we would like you to keep it to about a minute. Of uh, What is your vision of your, for your campaign and, 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 and the city in Ward 5? So we will start left to right. Tessa. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you again for having us here. It's been a pleasure to get together in person and to get to hear from one another. Um, and I hope it's been really informative to folks who are watching this. Um, you know, building a community that is equitable, sustainable, and healthy for all is going to require us to be bold. And it's going to require us to reimagine what is possible. A truly healthy community is one where everyone is physically, mentally, and emotionally well and feels known and valued. And we can be that kind of community here in Somerville. My campaign has knocked thousands of doors, and I have personally spoken to hundreds of residents. In these conversations, it is clear. Our neighbors are looking for courageous leadership and bold action to address their needs, whether it's affordable housing, um, a healthy planet, safe streets, or more reliable snow removal. We are well positioned as a community to meet these needs. I've laid out a clear vision, made commitments, and outlined a path forward to get there. There is so much that our city can and should do for residents. Um, and as city councilor, I will push our government to be more transparent and accessible. I will act with courage and remain accountable to the residents who elect me to deliver on the promise of our community. Thank you. Todd? We should be talking about Somerville Public Schools, development and traffic, housing and affordability and density with the same urgency we apply to broad scale national equity platforms. As your counselor, I will stay focused where our local government should be, right here in the city. Future development will be subject to extensive community input as we grapple with breadth and scale, including input from local businesses. Some of those transportation, traffic, and parking master plans will re be reviewed through new lenses and prioritized as equitable, inclusive, and safe. Some of those most vulnerable populations will be helped without hostility. Election day is Tuesday, September 14th. I'm here today asking for your vote. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. So I'm excited to share, as I said, my professional, my personal um, skills. I've been studying cities since I was undergrad as an architect. I worked in cities, and I believe in sharing a vision, but, but with the community. I'm a, I'm a community builder. I am a person who works in a group. I remember my first architecture project that was, had famous awards and why they put a Puerto Rican, Catholic Puerto Rican to do a synagogue, I'm not really sure. Uh, but I remember the art lead architect saying, you, you did a great contribution. I said, that wasn't me. And he said, you know what it was? It's, it's the best designs are those that everybody's involved. And that's how I see our city. I want everybody to involve, everybody to be included. And yes, we've had hard moments. I COVID made us realize there's some injustices and that we need to work at, but we can work on those uh, things together. We need to account and represent the underrepresented, and we need to be creative and have a vision. That's, I'm excited to do that. I, I think we will do this well, and I hope we have a vision, and I hope to share your values. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, I want to thank our three candidates here for taking their time on a uh, brutally warm uh, afternoon here in Somerville. Uh, uh, this is, you're watching this on tape later on, but it is very warm outside today and people have to come in uh, and, and do this. So I want to thank our candidates uh, for, for doing this uh, and for sharing their ideas uh, about Ward 5 and, and, and the city. As a reminder, uh, the last day to register to vote 
or to change your address for the preliminary, preliminary election is Wednesday, August 25th. The preliminary election will be held on September 14th. And from that point, the two, the two top vote getters will move forward to the uh, final election, which will be held on November 2nd, uh, 2021. So once again, I'm Adam Sweeting, uh, and it is, this has been a production of the Somerville Media Center. Uh, thank you to our candidates and to our viewers, and please get out and vote. Thank, thank you. you.